We would like to welcome everyone to our Meaningful Use webinar today. My name is Brian Roberts, Director of Operations here at Healthcare Compliance Pros, and we thank you for attending this webinar. We hope it will be very beneficial to you. Uh, we have had several clients uh, request and, and ask for additional resources and tools to help them, in particular with this Meaningful Use Incentive Program, and we're very excited for uh, this announcement. Uh, we're going to have a great discussion today. We have two expert panelists uh, from Healthcare Compliance Pros that will be joining us today. Eric Christensen, who's our Director of Client Services, uh, who has uh, spoke at several conferences and uh, is very knowledgeable in this area of, of meaningful use. We also have uh, one of our Director of uh, Compliance Support, Chad Schiffman. Uh, he has helped and assisted several clients through meaningful use audits, uh, along with helping them through uh, other key areas with regard to their compliance program. So with that, we're going to go ahead and get started. Again, as a reminder, this call is being recorded. Your lines are muted. However, we do want participation. So if you do have any questions as we're going along uh, through, this, through this presentation, please use the chat feature there. Uh, it should be located at the top of your uh, presentation window. And just ask those questions. We'll be addressing those questions as we go through this webinar and answer more of them fully at the end. If you have some questions in particular that you don't want to maybe get in too much detail, at the end of the, at the, end of the webinar we'll provide some information. You can email or you can call us directly and we can work with you one-on-one uh, -on -one with those specific issues you might be having with your Meaningful Use program. So we're going to get started right now. I uh, would like to start off with uh, asking a key question why we're really having this webinar to Eric. Eric, uh, what are clients' primary concerns that you've seen regarding this incentive program? Well, I think there's um, a couple of different issues that clients have been concerned with. First of all, it's the first attestation. It's understanding the attestation process, the documentation process, and then I think there's a secondary concern is once you've attested, once you've received your dollars, um, you're kind of on pins and needles waiting and seeing if and when you do receive an audit letter from the CMS appointed auditor, Bigliosian Company, uh, that letter would come possibly, would come primarily to the email address you used when you performed your attestation, but secondarily, um, comes as part of the, um, could come in the mail if that, as a follow-up to that. Now, you know, a lot of groups are attesting and not knowing if their documentation meets the, sta meets the standards, but um, that's really the question that most of our clients have is, how does the attestation process work? And secondarily, does the documentation that I'm getting out of my EMR meet the standards and do I know what the standards are? Um, some of the core measures, some of the meaning, uh, some of the menu measures, some of the quality reporting measures, um, does it meet all of those standards? And they're not experts in meaningful use, nor the standards, and they're wondering, can and do, do they meet those standards? During the, that calendar year, 2013 to 2014, more than 7,400 pre- and post-payment audits were conducted by the CMS auditor, Figliozzi and Company. Now these were eligible professionals or um, covered entity um, audits. And of those 7,400 audits that were conducted, 21% failed in their prepayment audit. Now CMS is ramping up prepayment audits. Rather than trying to get the money back later, they're moving into a, into a methodology of performing audits prior to um, the client receiving payments. Secondarily, we have people who have 24% of those audits were failed in a post-payment um, scenario. So you can see from the numbers that, that it's practically um, a one in four chance that if you are subject to an audit, that that audit will result in a failure. Now long-term, we know that that failure isn't necessarily going to result um, in a return. There are various resources to um, perform a, an appeal, and the appeal process can be long and somewhat arduous. So 
that's why you know we've created the documentation program that we have. We've created the education program that we have, so people know going in that they're going to pass and have the documentation in place that they need. And how many core measures are we really talking about here in these stages? Okay. Well, when we talk about the stages themselves, we can be talking about, you know, stage one, there are 13 core measures. And all of those core measures must be addressed and reported on and must be met, all, four, all 13 core measures. Um, five of nine menu objectives. Um, those are different types of um, different types of levels that must be achieved, and then of course the clinical quality measures in stage one and in stage two they must meet nine and sixty four clinical quality measures. Now those clinical quality measures um, can be reported as part of the attestation process or can be reported as part of the um, QRS or quality reporting um, system that is part of the attestation process. Um, and that's how that process works. Now, in stage two, they've moved beyond 13 core measures to 17 core measures. Now, those 17 starts to become, you know, more patient interaction, you know, providing evident, evidence that the, um, that the patients have used a patient portal, that you've used um, and provided um, patient interaction of reporting systematic information. Again, moving into more public health types of things with, um, those core measures um, as we move into stage two. So having all these different core measures that they're, they're supposed to be meeting, what, what, what are the primary concerns that have, uh, that have been asked re most recently by, by many clients? Well, Chad has worked with a number of um, clients specifically with their meaningful use audits. Um, Chad, do you have any thoughts on what we're doing as far as actual clients and their responses to meeting these objectives? A lot of the requirements that we're seeing that need to be addressed and aren't adequately being addressed are uh, submission or review of a security risk analysis that's done during the actual reporting period. Oftentimes, we're running into clients that think that it's a one and done process. They can do an SRA and then just include that when in fact it actually needs to be reviewed and um, or or done during that actual reporting period. It's not okay just to simply do it during that stage. You have to ensure that it's actually done during the actual reporting period or attestation period that they're looking for. So that's one concern. Other concerns we've ran into, uh, making sure you have supporting documentation. That's probably the biggest thing, um, supporting documentation for um, public health measures, other requirements that they're required to submit as part of their paperwork in the event of an audit has proved to be challenging for some. What we found is the EMR does a good job at giving you the reports so long as, uh, <laughs> excuse me, as long as clients can actually access them, print them out and store them and have them readily available. So that's one of the really exciting things about what we're doing is providing this opportunity for clients to actually have that capability. So, You know, I would say, Brian, that a thing that comes up quite a bit with groups that are doing meaningful use attestation is they're relying on the EMR to produce reports. They're assuming that the report that the EMR is producing meets the guidelines, um, specifically includes um, systematic or patient information for the reporting period, um, and sometimes the report hasn't been adequately reviewed. Um, it isn't necessarily reviewed successfully until an auditor is reviewing that documentation and finding out that um, the patient information as included in the report doesn't reflect the reporting period or doesn't meet a threshold specifically for the reporting period for which they're testing. That's the first thing. Then the second part of it is we have a lot of groups that produce that reporting, know that the reporting exists, they have change over within their organization, we have a, a six-year window that the, um, that the auditor, the CMS auditor can come back and look at the attestation. People change over, documentation is lost, they're not compiling what we call our book of evidence um, to support their attestation, nor do they have the ability to, to um, get all of it and combine all of that information into one source. 
Um, so that we're running into a lot of that with our clients as well. So these these definitely sound like a lot of the the issues and, and phone calls that I know you guys have been receiving and helping clients with over the the past several months. Uh, now that now that we have this this concern and this issue addressed, you know what what is the resolution? What are you know what how are we going to be able to help these administrators who are overseeing this program for their practice? Uh, overcome these these issues and concerns? Well, what we've been excited to, to realize is creating an online um, an online storehouse or binder, if you will, that, um, that book of evidence gives the individual um, practice administrators a single source for every attestation and every stage of attestation for every provider within that uh, within that particular clinic or practice um, or location of service to be able to upload and control all of that documentation to meet uh, to meet all of those objectives, whether they be the core objectives, whether they be the menu, uh, menu objectives, or whether they be those clinical quality measures, all of that documentation can be uploaded for each individual NPI, for each individual location, um, and for each individual less, less attestation period. Because when it comes down to it, we've been through, you know, you know, hundreds of audits with our clients. And when we talk about those audits, we're talking about individual NPI numbers. If you're in charge of five NPI numbers, it may be two NPIs that are audited. If you're in charge of 40 or 400 NPI numbers, there may be a select number of those NPIs that are audited and your entire book of evidence now becomes an issue of co correlating and combining all of that data to respond to that auditor's request. So to that end, we have created an entire digital attestation binder under our core program to provide a one-stop location to where we can upload and create all of that attestation documentation. Now, along with that is our educational program, all of the checklists and guides, and the support from the HCP advisor to meet those requirements um, for those practice administrators. Now you have this Meaningful Use Plus product as well. I know that the core product will help them start to become more organized and document and, and manage this on their own. What's the difference between the, the core version of Meaningful Use and the Plus version? Well, our Meaningful Use Core program is really for um, administrators who understand the process, are very comfortable with um, their documentation, and are looking for some place to warehouse it, to provide education to their employees and to their um, administrators and providers on their requirements under Meaningful Use. We have a specific um, training program for providers and administrators on what the Meaningful Use thresholds are, really kind of making sure that the providers are completely on board with what their requirements are, um, all of the checklists and guides, but the heart of that is that digital attestation binder and support for use of that binder and all of the educational materials under the core program. Now, the Encore is PLUS, and PLUS works the same way that um, our digital SRA prob um, our digital SRA problem, our program works. And that is that mock audit. We're going to comb through your documentation, review each individual report, review your specific requirements when it comes to um, when it comes to an NPI and their core measures. Under our program, our assessment program, we will actually set up a mitigation plan. Okay, every individual practice will have a mitigation plan to make sure that their documentation meets the meaningful use criteria across, again, the entire organization and every NPI or provider within that organization that's participating in meaningful use. So, and we follow that documentation through that entire assessment process. We provide a mitigation plan. The process is followed through historically as we move through the program to make sure that all follow-up and all documentation is supported throughout that program and how that program works within our system. Okay. So, for example, we 
No, go ahead. We have, we have the ability to upload all of our documentation for all of the core measures, and all of that documentation is timestamped and managed within each assessment and with each time period within each meaningful use stage. So for stage one, um, year one and two, year stage two, two years one and two, and even up to and including stage three, when and if those standards are completely codified and released and moved on to within 2016, all of those binders will be available within our assessment program for each individual provider within the organization as well. Now that gives you that one location and that one location of service to provide all of the documentation for your product and for your system and the ability to look at and review all of your thresholds that were met within this program and all of the historical data within this program as well. So when I'm looking through and looking at all the assessments for each individual core measure, your HCP specialist will be reviewing those, those core menu and quality reporting systems or qu clinical measures throughout the entire adaptation process. Now, I know Chad's worked through this process completely uh, with our clients. How has the process been working for you, Chad? Well, it's been working really good, and what's really exciting about it to me is the value that it gives our clients in that as we are able to compile this book of evidence and, and, and compile a timeline, it's really nice to be able to go to it and be able to say, we have everything in this one stop. We can review it. We can provide you assurances that, yes, you're going to meet the requirements for Stage 1 meaningful use. Yes, you're going to meet the requirements for Stage 2 meaningful use. So that in the event of an audit, we just simply present this book of evidence to uh, Pigliozzi or whoever is needing it, like let's say it gets to a uh, formal appeals process with CMS. These are just valuable things that we are able to help with that once we provide it, uh, having it all, all together just makes it a much smoother process. That way, if we do need to do an audit response, we can say, see this, see that, we have it, you're good. Big um, Leo Z likes to see certain, I'll, I'll go back to the SRA. Um, I think that's one thing that is really valuable is when the SRA and the Meaningful Use Plan is done collectively, we can be on the shadow of a doubt show that yes, it was done during that time period. I know I'm focusing a little bit on the SRA, that's just simply because so many of the audits have been failed as a result of SRA difficulties. So. Well, when we talk about this program, it's not just a matter of that book of evidence, it's not just a matter of the review of it, it's also all of the support. It's the education for your employees, for your providers, to provide that level of training for and making sure that everybody's enrolled in the process. So our Meaningful Use Core Program training includes all of the threshold, educates your administration and your providers on their specific requirements. Now, also remember that just beyond that reviewing of that information, we have the audit response support. In fact, audit support, response and support throughout the entire appeals process. Drafting that appeals letter, developing the documentation specifically for that appeal and following it through. Now, as we talked earlier, we had a group that went through an eight-month process through the appeals process. We walked them through that entire documentation. We walked them through all of the appeal audit procedures, all of the appeal letter uh, preparation are all done under our Meaningful Use Plus program. And again, that PLUS program includes not only access to all of our core objectives, it also includes all of the education and all of the support through that appeals process as well. Now, what I does it do? something important. Oh, oh, excuse me. Go ahead, Chad. <laughs> I was going to say, I think something important to note on that is once we were actually contacted by the client, we found out that they were really struggling with their meaningful use program and the one that you just referenced. And what I thought was amazing is how quick we were able to actually get them through the process once we were involved with it. Um, it ultimately ended up costing them, you know, it took them eight months to get their incentive payment 
but we were able to expedite that and ensure they actually did get a payment rather than no payment by helping them. So that's just part of the value of the program that I'm really excited about. Yeah, I, what I think is beautiful about this isn't just the fact that we're creating that book. We're also reviewing and making sure that every piece of documentation meets the standard, meets the reporting period for which you're attesting, or we're providing, like I said, that corrective action or mitigation that must be done within your program to make sure that it meets. Because when we go back to that first question you asked, Brian, it's, it's the pins and needles process, right? It's, I, I attested, I, I'm not trained in attestation. That's not something that I do as a practice administrator. I'm hoping that the EMR is doing its job, but really the EMR is meant and templated to, cr to create and collect this data, but they're not helping you through the attestation process. They're not making sure that the reports that are generated are meeting the attestation period. They're not doing any of that. They're not a stopgap, nor are they protecting the practice against those audit, that audit finding and that audit response. That's what healthcare compliance pros is bringing into the mix here. Yeah, and if you could just expound maybe just a little bit on that, Eric. We had one, uh, one participant ask, what about, what about their EMR? Shouldn't much of this, they're, they're new, they actually just uh, started uh, at a new practice and they wanted to know, shouldn't much of this be provided through the, the group's EMR? They haven't dug too much into it, but with the exposure that both of you have had with several different versions of EMRs, um, isn't a lot of this information gathered or stored for them there? The information is gathered within the EMR. In fact, you're templating your encounter forms, you're, in, you're templating um, your patient demographic collection information, the questions that are going to be asked during that patient encounter. You know, there could be diabetes education, could be smoking sensation, there could be a, many different thresholds. Um, there's um, immunization records that are recorded and, and transferred via public health um, links. The EMR is very good about that. And it can even be good about reporting, about generating reporting. Um, one of the issues that we run into is they're very good about generating reports at the time that you're requesting the reports. Sometimes they're not so good about generating a report in, in a historical setting where, well, guess what? I got an audit and I have to go back and prepare a report from three years ago. Well, I can't give a snapshot in time of what that patient population looked at looked like three years ago. I can look at it now. So that's a very big issue is making sure that the documentation is reported correctly. But the EMR is producing reporting that the particular practice is requesting. It isn't doing all of the work to make sure that the reports that are generated meet the standards, that the providers are meeting the standards going forward um, and all of those objectives. They're not doing that for the practice. Nor are they, again, helping the practice by reviewing um, all of the documentation in an audit scenario writing and collecting the data in response to that audit, the appeals process, and educating the practices with regards to what the standards are. You know, the EMR doesn't come in and say, well, guess what? These are the um, clinical reporting measures that you want to do within your practice. That's left up to that individual practice to determine what their thresholds are going to be. The EMR can say, well, we have other practices who are moved using these thresholds but they're not determining what the thresholds are going to be for that individual practice. Healthcare Compliance Pros provides all of that support. So that's um, what the EMRs are and aren't doing specifically for it. And Chad, um, can, you, can you talk a little bit about when, that, when they do submit that information to you, then what role, do, what role would you end up playing or your department play to help them uh, accomplish those tasks that uh, apparently their EMR isn't providing for them? Well, we would, first of all, we'd review any information that they provide to us to ensure that, for one, that their documentation supports the requirement uh, for meaningful use, whether it's a menu measure, whether it's a core measure. We, we want to make sure that it's meeting that requirement and reporting requirement. If for some reason it looks to be lacking or maybe a red flag if CMS looks at it, what we'd like to do is go ahead and give them advice on to where they could actually 
get that data, whether it's screenshots, whether it's different reports that they just may not have access to. Part of the problem, too, is even if they can get the reports, oftentimes the one that's historical, we've ran into time gaps where they run into issues getting it quickly from the EMR company. So we may need to help them expedite that, um, give them tips on how they can go ahead and get that documentation to support what they need to report on. So those are some of the things we like to look at when the information is provided to us. And we had a question come in, Chad. I was wondering if you could talk to this. They're saying, you know, what benefit would this service provide them given that they've already been audited and that they've passed that audit? You know, what uh, what what additional benefit could, could this service play? Well, I, I think there's a couple of things, in my opinion, that uh, this could do. For one, it's a good store storage location to maintain all of their documentation in the event they need to refer to it further. Um, two, as part of our review, we provide our response and our recommendations based off of experience and, and what we've been through uh, to give them some sort of um, feedback for what they might do in the future, not only with, you know, if they've moved on to stage two, that's part of the assessments that we can include, um, and we can provide tips on that as well. So um, having it, too, in that one, well, and also let's go back here for a minute. Um, as far as if it's one MPI that has participated and been audited and you're a part of a group that has five or six more physicians that haven't been audited, by actually storing that information with all the tips that we've provided, you'd be able to report with those other physicians as well. You could submit that information to us based off of each of those MPIs. So just because one physician has been through an audit doesn't necessarily mean that another one won't within that practice because, as Eric said, it's based off of MPI. Um, and then also, I, back to stage two, I think that's really important to get to in that we help you through that process. And if for some reason you're being audited for stage two, it's just like the stage one binder. We help you with that as well. Um, and then the same will be true for stage three when it finally rolls out. Yeah, I think that's a, that's a key point, Brian, is that this isn't just for attestations moving forward. This is for your historical attestations as well. Now, we provide document review for clients, and we have provided document review for clients historically for attestations that were per performed back in 2011, 2012, 2013, 2014. Because even though they've submitted the attestation and they're hoping that they're correct, We've done that same process for those clients as well for all of their historical attestation periods, meaning I want to go back and look at my 2012 attestation. I want somebody to review it to make sure that if, for some reason, again, we have this six-year window, if I have to go back and look and provide audit um, that support for that, I need to know that my documentation meets the standards. I do not want to be scrambling when I get that letter and, and Chad spoke to that, we, you have a window, and we don't want to be scrambling within that window to try and produce that documentation. We want to be proactive. We want to know that our repository already has all of the documentation, all of the support necessary if an audit letter is received, that we can respond to that. And that's what healthcare compliance process is, is delivering, is not only moving forward, but all of that historical review and repository to meet all of those um, attestation audit responsibilities. Well, at this time, we want to uh, again remind the participants if they do have any questions to use the chat feature. Uh, we have had several questions coming in uh, to us directly. If, uh, if you do have questions, feel free to ask that in the chat window. One uh, question we have, uh, look, it looks like uh, you've provided some answer to it, but they ask, um, I have several providers that are participating in meaningful use and have attested in multiple reporting periods. Does this product help me through each provider in each reporting period? It goes back to that MPI number. So we have the capability to upload multiple reports for each MPI number. So yes, we could definitely help with every provider who is part of um, who's participating in meaningful use. The key is to ensure that we have them all submitted based off of each individual MPI. Perfect. And this, and here's a, a, another question. Uh, 
it's with regard to appeals i know we've you i think you might have answered some of it after they after they asked it what about appeals does this program include support throughout the appeals process yeah the example that i gave over that eight month period there were um a couple of different appeal letters that were drafted um with healthcare compliance pros um, documentation was generated as part of our appeals support. So the entire appeals process is supported under the Meaningful Use Plus program through, through and into completion. Now, what's interesting about that appeals process is we've never not had, and I, I know that's kind of hard to prove a negative, but we have never not had an appeal upheld. So all of our appeals have been successful with all the documentation that we've been maintaining within our system for our clients. What we've done now is just formalize that and bring that expertise into and codify it within this core and PLUS program. Um, and again, under the PLUS program, that includes all of that appeals process. And then we've had this question asked uh, from uh, a few individuals. I'm sure everyone's wanting to know, but they say, what does this product cost and how can I justify adding this service to my docs? Well, we have, um, we've been doing this on a consulting basis. We have formalized it. Um, we do have, an, for um, the rest of this year, for people who are attending this webinar, we do have an introductory pricing. Uh, the core program uh, is $30 per month and is $5 per user. Now, that includes education. That includes education for all of your employees. It includes uh, the entire attestation binder for your entire practice and all of the providers within your practice included in that $30 per month and $5 per employee. Meaningful Use Plus is priced out um, a little bit differently because Meaningful Use Plus is priced out per provider. So when we're providing a mock audit, we're providing a mock audit for each individual um, provider within this program. So. The Meaningful Use Plus program is $650 for that first provider, and each additional provider is $350 in each attestation period for which we're providing audit support, documentation review, mitigation planning, corrective action plan support, and then the entire appeals process for each one of those attestation periods. As far as justifying it to your doctor, you know, we can go back to and talk about that you know, $14,000 per provider per attestation period, that's first year. Um, it does go down each individual year. But what is your overhead if you were to have to provide all of the review and all of the appeals process if and when that does occur? Now, we also come back to that concept of, you know, we have a, almost a 20, a one in four chance of if an audit occurs, that we're going to have an audit failure, whether that's a pre- or post-payment audit. And what's your overhead of defending that audit if and when it does occur? So that's where we talk about this mock audit, that attestation testing, because what we want to know is that we're going to pass. We don't want to hope that we're going to pass. We don't want to have to do a bunch of work to pass. We don't ever want this process to get to the appeals because we know that we're going to pass the first time every time. And that's the same thing that happens with our security risk analysis provided under our HIPAA Plus program. We know that they're going to pass every time. Our SRAs have passed every time. Now, clients who come to us for attestation periods for which they've done an SRA at other times, we've supported that under our HIPAA Plus program, and we've gone back and have to fix that. But we know that it's much more work to fix it after the fact than it is to come pre-prepared. And that's what this PLUS program does, is it builds a program that is audit-proof. The documentation's been reviewed. The SRA's been reviewed. We know that you're not going to have to appeal your audit because we know you're going to your pass your appeal the first time. And that's what the PLUS program delivers. Perfect. Any final words from, from, from either of our panelists today? But, Chad, you talk about your experiences and how, where the value you think uh, this program is? Well, again, I, I think just being able to have, you know, not only the review, but you're going to have the full-blown documentation. You're going to have the support. All of that is just a, a great value to a client. Um, 
I know with our experience that we have here at Healthcare Compliance Pros that we can certainly help practice administrators, providers, uh, clinics, hospitals even. We can help everybody with this process, and, and that's our goal here is we want to make sure that everybody has a successful attestation and doesn't, you know, feel stressed out in the event of an audit because, in our opinion, meaningful use, when when done correctly, does serve a good purpose, um, and that's the benefit of this program is it ensures that you are uh, – getting the incentives that you were promised as part of the Meaningful Use program. So that's what I'm really excited about, and I hope to be able to work with a lot of you on all this. So, Well, thank you, Chad. You know, we really do feel this is a valuable product. It's something that practice administrators are not trained in, in nor, you know, is it, that, that, is it that, you know, I get the letter, I'm not sure. It's the pins and needles factor. We're audit proofing the practice when it comes to meaningful use. We're reviewing all of that documentation for you. The price point, again, very low. Three hundred and fifty for an individual provider for a certain, for a specific attestation period. Think of the think of the remuneration you're getting for that attestation period. Or if you fail that attestation period, the penalties that can be brought up as part of as part of a failure or not meeting meaningful use in any particular reporting period because we're talking about moving into that, you know, that rather than the incentive program, we're moving into um, the penalty phase of not meeting meaningful use. So let's know that we're meeting those quality reporting standards, that all of the documentation has been reviewed. That's really where the threshold is. Now, perfect. Well, meaningful use, oh, go ahead, Eric. The, the meaningful use program, we have contact information up here on our slide. But you can also find about meaningful use under the more um, features program on our website as well. Okay. Thanks. And again, we we'd like to thank both of our panelists today. Hopefully, this uh, this webinar has been educational and informative. Uh, as a reminder, this is going to be recorded. We will be posting this uh, and making this available to all of our clients. Uh, if you want more information or if you want to share this information with any of your uh, doctors or any of your other uh, administrative team, please feel free to uh, shoot us an email or contact us at the information provided there on your screen. We can get you more information. But again, thank you for your participation, and uh, hopefully we can be a great resource for you and your organization with regard to meaningful use.